Hello, this is Eric White. This is the next screencast in a series of screencasts on recursive pure functional transformations. We've covered a lot of ground already. We've covered a lot of the core concepts of functional programming. We've also reviewed the detailed semantics of XML for people who need a little bit of a refresher. We want to be very clear and very precise in our use of XML semantics. That's going to become very important when we start writing these interesting transforms. And now that we've covered the semantics of XML, the next thing to cover is linked XML. Linked XML is a programming API that enables these interesting types of transformations. There are going to be three screencasts on linked XML. This first screencast is on functional construction. Following this, we're going to have a screencast on dealing with namespaces and linked XML. And finally, we're going to talk about linked XML axis method or linked XML axes. Those are synonyms, the axis methods or axes. Prior to linked XML, and actually even to this date in many programming environments, the main way that you program with XML is through DOM document, through one of the various DOM document implementations. In most of the browsers, the XML programming API is something like the DOM parser. DOM parser is more or less standardized on these days. Or if you're using an older Microsoft browser, then Microsoft.XMLDOM is a programming API. All of these are implementations of DOM document, and DOM document is a standard way to interact with XML. The main idea of DOM document is that there is one API with a particular set of semantics for all of these various methods, and this API is the same regardless of what language you're using. The actual syntax you might use will be different if you're doing it in Java or JavaScript or C Sharp or C++, but the semantics of the various methods are the same, more or less. But there are some problems with DOM document. To summarize the problems, it's, it's sometimes it's a bit cumbersome to deal with DOM document. So as an example, every node needs to be attached to a document and this is really an artificial constraint that is on the system, that there's nothing intrinsic about a node that requires that it be attached to a document, and this complicates the programming API quite a bit. Further, DOM document is kind of set up in the old way of working with XML where you create child nodes and then add them to their parent element, and then you add that parent element to its parent element, and you end up with this long string of not very complicated imperative code that you can often see with DOM code where you're building up the XML tree. There are other ways to get around this. Sometimes people just have the XML as text in their application and then they use the parser to transform that text into an XML tree, but that adds the overhead of parsing that XML in the middle of your program. And Further, it means that you're stepping outside of your native language, whether you're working in JavaScript or Java or C-sharp, and you're putting the XML into your program as a string. It's not ideal. And what you find after you've written a DOM document program is your code doesn't look very much like the XML that it's producing. Well, in contrast with linked XML, the code does more or less resemble the XML that you're producing. So here we can see a little linked XML example. We can see it creates a root element with the name of ROOT, and it creates a couple of child elements, and these child elements each have an attribute with the name of ATT. The code looks more or less like the XML that it produces. And if we run this example, you can see that, in fact, the XML does look more or less like the code that produced that XML. And there are other reasons that we like linked XML. Linked XML is fundamentally based on Link, the language integrated query technology that is part of C Sharp and Visual Basic.net. And as such, it's rooted in functional programming ideas. 
it is specifically designed to be able to write these types of recursive pure functional transforms that we're studying in this screencast series. These types of transforms simply are not possible when using a technology such as DOM document. Or if it is possible, it's extremely cumbersome. I've never actually worked through all the issues to successfully write a recursive pure functional transform using DOM document. A couple of other points about this is the linked XML programming interface is very nice and very symmetric. So as an example here, we can change this X attribute constructor to X element. And if we run the example, we see in fact that that attribute got changed to an element. This symmetry in the programming API is something that we'll make use of as we are proceeding on in our path of writing interesting transforms of XML. So let's examine this X element constructor in a bit more detail. Here we can see an example of creating a new X element object and we've passed one, two, three, in other words, an integer of one, two, three in as content to this X element. And if I run it, we see that in fact, we have a root element with a content of one, two, three. And so we've passed an integer into this X element constructor. Well, we can in turn, we can also pass a string. I'll change it to ABC. And if I run it, we can see that we have now changed the content of that root element to be the string of ABC. And we can also change this. So it's one, two, three point four, five, six. In other words, we're passing a floating point number as content to that X element. And we can see that in fact, it does create an X element with the contents of one, two, three dot four, five, six. So how does this work? The way that this works is that the X element constructor takes a params array, in other words, a variable length argument of object. And the X element constructor then makes appropriate and interesting decisions about how to insert the content that you pass in this array of objects to the constructor. And that's what enabled us to pass in an integer, pass in a floating point number, or pass in a string. Well, it goes beyond this. We can actually declare an array, for instance. So now I've declared a new array and I'm using the array initialization syntax of C sharp where it implicitly determines the type of the array. So this array becomes an array of X element objects. And I can now go into this constructor and instead of passing a single value or a scalar value of one, two, three or of ABC, I can pass that array into that constructor. And when I run this example, we can see in fact that those two elements that are in that array get added as child elements to the contents of this root element. And the way that this works is that the X element constructor examines every item in that params array. And if that item implements the I enumerable interface, in other words, if that item is a collection in some form or another, and arrays implement IE enumerable, then the X element constructor will iterate through all the contents in that array and add each item in that array as contents to whatever element it's constructing. This allows us to do some interesting things such as here I can alter this array. Well, first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to change it to a new array of object. I'm going to remove the type inference. So now I can put any type of content that I want to into this array. I'm going to add a string into the array. At that point, I am going to add another string here. And finally, I'll add a floating point number. 
And if I run this example, then what we see is that it then took the contents of that array and created what's called mixed content in XML. We talked about mixed content in the XML screencasts just before this screencast in the series. Here we can see that the first child node of root is ABC, the string ABC. And then we see the first X element child, which is child with content of one, two, three. Then we see the string of DEF. Then we see the second child element. And finally, we see the 123.456, which is a text node created from that floating point number that was in that array. Even more than this, it's actually a recursive algorithm. So I can modify this. So let's say that I, I'll take out that DEF out of there, and I will now create a this new array is one of the elements in the array of object. So now this array of object C has a string of ABC. It has another array of two X elements. And then it has a floating point number of 123.456. And if I run it, we can see that in fact it did what we expected it to do, which is that it recursively iterated through that array that is a child element of the array that we passed to the constructor. I'm going to modify this example a little bit here. I'm going to take out the string so that we're not going to be creating mixed content. And I want to do that because it will make it easier to show the next point that I want to show. So if we run this example, we're back to where we were, where we see that we have the root element and two child elements. And this is no longer mixed content, so the serializer is free to indent the XML as we wish it to. The next point is that it's allowable to pass null in to these constructors at any point. So in this array, I can add null as the first item in the array C. Further, I can even add null as the first item in this child array. And I can put null in as the last element in the array of C. And if I run this, we see the exact same thing. And the reason why we see this is that null is a valid value for content of an X element. And all that happens in the X element constructor is it simply ignores all null values. So those nulls just get thrown away. This is going to be important later on when we start writing our recursive transforms. Let's say that there is some element that we want to delete from the transformed array. In other words, we don't want that element to be duplicated in the cloned array that we're creating in our transform. What we can do is instead of creating that element, we can return null. And this isn't going to make exact sense to you right now until we actually talk about our recursive transforms and how to write those. But suffice it to say that this is the means by which we can delete elements out of a transformed array. Key point about this is that null is valid content to add to an X element object. And the only point about this is that all null values are thrown away. So we've talked about functional construction here. We've created some elements. We've created some attributes. We've put in values of various types into these elements and attributes. In some cases, our content are child elements. In other cases, they're child X attribute objects. And in other cases, they're actually arrays of X element or X attribute objects. There's a whole variety of content that we can pass to these X element constructors. And this gives us a lot of flexibility with constructing our XML trees. An interesting resource on MSTN is this page here, which is the valid content of X element and X document objects. You can find this page at this link. And for completeness, let's review the JavaScript equivalents. Here we have a little bit of code that creates the same XML tree. If we run it, we see, in fact, it creates the same root element and a couple of child elements.
The semantics of the JavaScript implementation of LinkedXML are very similar to the .NET implementation of LinkedXML. In other words, I can change this X attribute to an X element. And if I run it, we see that in fact that child attribute got changed to a child element. I'll change that back. Further, I can declare a new array. And I can modify that constructor to use that array. And if I run this, we see exactly what we expected to see. I can modify this array so that it uses interspersed strings. And we can see the same mixed content for that XML. We can see that I can modify this example in the exact same way where I make our array C to contain a child array of two X elements. And when I run it, we see exactly the same thing that we saw before. This JavaScript implementation of linked XML is something that I put together for a particular project where I needed to duplicate some functionality that I had in Power Tools for OpenXML. This functionality was literally thousands of lines of code long and rewriting all of this functionality using DOM document, well, I'm sorry, it just wasn't going to happen. So it turned out it was easier for me to write a small implementation of linked XML specifically designed for JavaScript. I can get rid of these two nodes so that now, again, we are going to create an XML tree that actually can be indented. And finally, I can put in null values in exactly the same way in our JavaScript example as we had in C Sharp. And if we run it, we see the exact same results. This ability to take a null value as an argument is so important to these types of transformations, these recursive pure functional transformations, that of course I had to implement that exact same functionality, the exact same semantics in the JavaScript implementation of Link to XML. This ability to create XML trees in Link to XML is not limited to just creating XML trees using the X element and X attribute constructors. You can also parse XML strings. You can load XML strings from other resources. And in .NET, you can load XML using XML readers. Well, all of these approaches are interesting, but they're not really germane to our project of learning about recursive pure functional transformations. So I didn't focus on those. But if you're a linked XML person, or if you're a student of linked XML, you'll find lots of examples of creating XML in a variety of different ways. But what is important to us when writing these types of transformations is this ability to use the linked XML constructors, in other words, these X element and X attribute constructors in this specific fashion. That's all I'm going to cover in this screencast. In the next screencast, I'm going to address namespaces and how you work with X names and X namespaces in linked XML. It'll be important to understand X namespaces and X names when writing recursive pure functional transformations.